What's really interesting is that you're finding uh, 70 plus year old grandmas and you know granddads basically who are able to um, spend seven minutes under the water. Nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, higher IQ with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing and things of that nature. So it's quite a quite a important thing for any parents out there to kind of ensure their child has every possibility to breathe through the nose, you know. Lee, welcome back to the show. Hey Sim, how are you, man? <laughs> I'm uh, you know, I'm doing really good and I'm happy to see you again. So uh you've Twice. uh You've been writing a book recently, and it's coming out quite shortly, which is, uh, I think, quite an exciting time for you, like writing your first book, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking mostly about uh, that topic and other things. And maybe like we can start, first of all, with some background, because we uh, we go like pretty long time back, like we met... I guess like eight, no, no, six years ago or something like that. And uh, yeah, we've been, <laughs> we've uh, been, yeah, doing a lot of things uh, together as well in uh, this uh, online space. So yeah, I'm happy to speak with you again. Yeah, mate. It's really, it, yeah, it's, it's, it has been a while, hasn't it? I remember some of those cold, we did a couple of retreats together where we had like some water that was about this, this high and we were like <laughs> getting in there and stuff. So it was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, I guess it's always, you know, I, I always like find your story pretty interesting of uh, you being an Australian guy living in Finland. And uh, yeah, maybe we can start with, you know, how did you get, <laughs> how did you uh, end up in Finland and uh, especially doing like cold exposure and uh, breath work? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a quite a long journey, but I can narrow it down, of course, like, uh, you know. Like many, many foreigners meeting the foreign woman coming here like that. That's how I actually like got to Finland. If I'm be honest with you, I never actually, I, I probably was one of those people that thought there was like polar bears in Finland, you know, uh, to be honest, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And then of course I had the first winter here. Um, you know, I've had very, very little experience even with the snow and I tried to I tried to kind of like live like a bear really um like like kind of like simulate hibernation for the whole winter and it, it just felt horrible it felt absolutely horrible to do that and um at the same time my my colleagues had like really really uh urged me or even forced me <laughs> to go and experience the cold water um of course sauna it's a, it's sort of like sauna is a Finnish Finnish word of course in the English dictionary, uh, it's the only Finnish word. Um, sauna thing was like something I became familiar with, and being naked in the sauna with other other people was like something to come to terms with. But the cold was really something I didn't, I, I couldn't anticipate, you know. And these guys really, it was like a baptism of, I was going to say fire, but in in fact, it would be like ice. <laughs> so um, yeah, by they kind of kept forcing me there year after year and eventually i just sort of went and did my own thing i learned about it i made all the mistakes i felt like i was gonna honestly i felt sometimes i really overdone it uh, a bit panicked sometimes um but in actual fact i went to one party and they wanted to force me in the cold again and i kind of proved to them that i that i can do it now you know so uh everything self-taught all the mistakes have been made and now I'm happy to be able to share my knowledge and my my kind of like my experiences with people so that they can help uh it can help them you know um because cold and um by by default breathing as well breath work is kind of like really really two big health trends at the moment i, I would say mm. yeah yeah i agree and it's for sure like a lot of people can be quite you know exciting or like more yeah, like exotic thing like the cold exposure for sure like uh you know most people don't do winter swimming or ice ice baths on a regular basis and it can be uh, quite quite a, like a yeah, like a i guess yeah exotic uh thing but uh yeah it actually surprised me how many finnish people um sort of like don't do that too you know like mm -hmm. it really surprised me um sometimes it's just a like everyone has done it but nobody ha not everyone has this consistent practice of of uh cold exposure so um yeah it is an exotic thing for an australian to sort of like reintroduce the cold to to the Finns, selling the ice to the eskimos in a way <laughs> yeah and i mean 
your expertise in coal exposure far exceeds most Finnish people as well. So uh, yeah, like you actually ended up uh, learning from Wim Hof about uh, cold exposure. And uh, now you're also doing like these uh, under ice swimming. So like you're actually swimming under under the ice, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, typical that's that's me and my personality uh there you know like i always i i like to kind of like test myself and uh put the training to the test too. put myself in unique situations where i would learn about myself and of course like yeah the in a way like ice diving is very you know, ice diving or mo- moving under the water on one breath is essentially free diving which also relates very closely to breathing and not breathing so it was kind of like an easy it was an easy um you know it was an easy way it like it just really stimulated me you know the cold mm. cold exposure and the feeling of being completely um submerged underwater but then also knowing that you can control control what's going on in your body so i think um a lot of people when they do an ice bath you 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 see it quite often that people are kind of in there they have their hands together because they don't want to put their hands in and stuff and they kind of in a way like disassociate from the experience or they they put their mind somewhere else Whereas you don't get that same opportunity when you're under the ice, you know, you have to be in complete command of your body and you have to be like really present. You can't kind of disappear anywhere else. Otherwise, obviously something, something might happen. So yeah, it's very, it's a, it's quite a contrasting thing to go right, like right under. Mm, Right. I think a lot of people, you know, might have a clue or like a, a little bit of understanding about that cold exposure has some health benefits. If you just you know do some uh, cold shower or sit in an ice bath for a little bit, but what are there any like actual health benefits of doing it with this uh, under the ice uh, swimming component as well? So you're like combining the breath hold for I guess how long is it like ten seconds or something, uh, and uh, the cold exposure at the same time because it's you know obviously quite like extreme uh, and uh, potentially dangerous as well. So are there like any is there anything worth it? other than like an adrenaline rush or something like that? Uh, you know, like I don't, I, w- I wouldn't know about any studies that are showing this because it is, like you said, it is kind of like um, a bit remote kind of thing to do in a sense, like not many people are really doing it like that. Um, but actually, like you get a lot of mental benefits for sure. I mean, um, you know, like we have like really cool uh, track record of like people going under and it's it, it's like what like i'm always saying you see somebody go under somebody else and 10 15 seconds later it's almost like they're a different person in a way because they they submerge or they resurface and they kind of like have this self-belief and they for many people it's like um you know sometimes a marathon is, is is for somebody you know they want they want to practice uh to run a run a marathon and that that takes weeks and weeks and months and months of training um and also like you know it's a really really long race and over the course of that whole event you might you might feel like you've changed or it might be a tick in the box somewhere but we kind of like minimize that in a way in terms of the length but then you know it's yeah i think the, the, it's mainly a mental uh barrier or sort of like a bucket list thing that uh, people get but like i said it's it's truly unique thing because of the what i mentioned before because you're you have to be present inside your body there's no there's no kind of like um getting away from that or whatever you know it feels really different and of course we know that for sure you're going to trigger uh the mammalian diver response in a really strong way which is like this ancient um response in the body where we actually um you can feel it in your body when everything slows down uh your body senses sort of like a stress or a kind of a threat in a sense um slows the way it slows the heart rate down and the way that the body uses oxygen and energy so it's kind of like it it sounds scary and it sounds like it could be this really like amped up um adrenaline thing adrenaline fuel thing uh but actually when you're under there it's really cold uh really calm and serene so it's not until after you get out then the adrenaline kicks and you know, people are really excited and whatever right yeah for sure what is the mammalian uh dive reflex that you mentioned yeah it's 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 said to be like uh an ancient uh, re- reflex from dating back to sort of an evolutionary 
evolutionary th theory in a way where we're water dwelling creatures and then of course we have um, evolved to form limbs and move out of the water and of course like we still have these remnants and in many cases there's there's a lot of um, conjecture about the the reallocation of different um, nerves in the body and and what they actually do today versus what they used to do and because we've been under the water diving um, when we have for example this trigeminal nerve it's across the forehead here when that um, hits hits the water or makes contact with uh, cold in any sense whether it's air or especially water uh, what it does is uh, send this signal that um, you need to um, use less uh, energy slows the heart rate down slows all the bod bodily processes down and gives you basically more time in the water um, and it's interesting because a lot of people that have experienced sort of the face dunking you know when they have the ice bath or the little bowl of ice like i think uh celebrities uh, were swearing by this like victoria beckham and all this they were they were kind of going crazy about it at some point because of the you know it's said to produce more collagen in, in the skin and it's uh you know keeps the skin tighter much you know, basically aesthetic reasons um it, be it became really really popular thing to do uh for this and many many people that were doing that were also m mentioning that they have this kind of calm relaxed feeling um afterwards as well also very invigorating feeling but um that's basically because of the trigeminal nerve cranial nerve that runs across the forehead signaling to slow down and relax in the body i want to take a quick break to tell you about the most evidence-based supplement stack out there let's be honest most supplements don't have any evidence that they would provide any significant health benefits as shown in human clinical trials that's unfortunate because a lot of people will end up buying some new hyped up longevity supplement thinking that it's going to make them live longer whereas in reality they're just making expensive urine fortunately there are a few supplements that do work and they have the evidence to prove that from dozens of clinical trials i've partnered up with do not age org to put together the longevity leap bundle that includes one of the most proven supplements the bundle has a starter pack and advanced pack that includes things like creatine monohydrate berberine collagen peptides glynac omega-3s vitamin d3 k2 and magnesium and trimethylglycine do not age was also gracious enough to add a free bottle of sulfora boost to every order which is a sulforaphane supplement that promotes glutathione production so if you want to get the starter pack that lasts for 60 days or the advanced bundle that lasts for 366 days then head over to do not age.org forward slash longevity dash leap dash bundle or check out the link in the description and use the code leap l-e-a-p for an exclusive 15 percent discount this is the largest discount code for do not age online and you won't get this from anywhere else and you'll also get the free sulfura boost which is amazing head over to do not age.org forward slash longevity dash leap dash bundle and use the code leap for a 15 percent discount all right back to the show breath holds and things like that they can also have some cardiovascular benefits so are there like what are some like physiological effects like does it have any heart rate variability benefits or yeah of course like it, yeah i mean like well first and foremost it's really interesting because um you know this there's this tribe of people that have been studied quite extensively off the coast of the philippines right uh the bajal uh group they're like these nomadic sea sea dwelling um tribe of people and um Often they live in these houses with big stilts or then they're just on boats. But about 80% of all the food that they eat is actually coming from foraging in, under the on the sea floor, you know, mm. of course, spear fishing and all of that. So um, what's really interesting is that um, you, you're finding 70-plus-year-old uh, grandmas and, you know, granddads basically who are able to um, spend seven minutes under the water. And they can also dive really, really deep as well. And so when they have been like trying to figure out like what, what are the differences, you know, um, between this group of people that have been, you know, spending a lot of time under the water, diving, free diving under the water, no oxygen, no additional, uh, equipment or anything like that. Just, just free diving. Um, the spleen size is actually bigger in them, uh, versus like fillet, you know, off the main, mainland philippines so they had done this study where they had compared the spleen spleen size 
um, and actually it's 50% bigger in, in this group of people. And then you kind of like ask, okay, so what does the spleen do? The spleen is actually, it's about the size of an avocado. It's found uh, just above the stomach here and on the, on the right-hand side, I believe. So it's actually like a blood reservoir and it actually carries some of the best, um, qual highest quality blood, meaning it has a lot of oxygen in it, high level uh, red blood cells, and it's coming um, actually straight from the uh, bone marrow as well. And so what has been happening is that with, um, with extended breath holds, you can actually see um, in, in, now we're not just talking about this group of people, but it's been studied in other groups of people as well, free divers and whatnot, that you get these splenic contractions. And the spleen will basically shrink in size. So it will kind of contract, it'll squirt. You know, it has somewhere between 250 to, in some cases, 500 mils of, of hematocrit, which is like highly oxygenated blood. And it will squeeze that out and because it's like a, another stress or sort of a threat situation wants to give you, your body wants to give you more time under the water. So it will squeeze or contract once, twice, maybe even three times in some instances where it gives you more of this oxygen um, and gives you more time under the water. So yeah, it's interesting. And that's an evolutionary thing too. So it's like in, in the generations um, from their, from their ancestry, it's actually becoming a stronger and stronger uh, trait in this group of people. Mm, wow! So, and we know that free divers are also practicing uh, practicing with these kind of uh, techniques as well, with the breath holding and these kind of uh, static apnea, where you see people kind of floating in the water and they they're trying to relax their body completely and trying to get to seven or eight minutes or maybe even longer in some cases. Wow! Yeah, like seven minutes is pretty long to hold your breath underwater. Like, what's the average person? Let's say, like you know. If you're a person in Helsinki or London, what's their like breath hold usually? Well, you see, in in the water, so like uh, when you when you go and get a, a free diving certification to get to that this level two, which is like most most free diving uh, resorts or courses or whatever, accepting people with this like cert certification two, it literally means that you would hold your breath for two minutes. And um, I've I've every course that i've been part of or every time i've participated of everyone has passed uh two minutes and uh i think it's a more of a mental thing because the body actually has so many interesting um pathways and possibilities to make you know to to keep you safe right like to have like there's a lot of residual oxygen inside the the body as well um so it's really a mental thing like calming the mind and calming you know, calming the thought processes. And of course, the brain requires oxygen and energy as well. So to quiet the mind and stop it thinking all these thoughts, that's also a really, really uh, good thing to do. So you can kind of get more time under the water. But yeah, about two minutes uh, is a pretty standard thing. Uh, and and actually, in many cases, uh, women are really, really high performance in um, apnea, uh, breath holding times as well. In fact, uh, many of the top free divers here in Finland are actually female as well. And mm -hmm. you probably have seen maybe ar around this Johanna Nordblad. She has uh, made uh, a Guinness Book of Records for, uh, I think, 105 meters under the ice on, on one breath, like, you know, swimming across. And uh, you probably may have heard of a, a guy called S uh, Stieg Severinsen, who's a, a Danish free diver and he has held his breath I, i've trained with him and he's held his breath for about 22 minutes under the water but that was with uh he had in, uh, inhaled pure oxygen so it mm -hmm. gives you a bit of an advantage but still you must have like some skills and ability to be able to even go to 22 minutes anyway even if it was assisted with pure oxygen so these are kind of extreme extreme uh circumstances of course and like but the common thing that I found and when I've been asking these kind of high performers the questions like, well, like what, what tips can you give it? Like mainly there was a lot of repetition in terms of like, you know, just practicing, practicing your breath holding, of course, but also they both practicing yoga. Um, in, that means that they would be opening up the, the physiology, like making sure that the, the diaphragm, they have a good mastery of the diaphragm. They have um, very flexible um, intercostal muscles, which are the, the muscles in between the rib, ribs uh, and keep, keeping the flexion in the, in the ribs. 
Uh, but then also they're always mentioning some specific um, mindfulness, like real-time mindfulness activities that they're doing because they just really need to quiet the mind. And in fact, Stig has a certain, he calls it like a video or a movie uh, that he watches like almost all the time because he can kind of time that to be 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, he kind of goes really into this kind of storyline or this lucid dreaming state in a way. Wow. Right. Are there like any, yeah, like you mentioned with uh, a bit of it already, but is is there like, let's say so, so a person who is able to hold, you know, seven minutes their breath versus someone who is able to hold it like only one minute, you know, you would, you would imagine that the person who holds it seven minutes is also slightly fitter and with better cardiovascular function or better lung function or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, I guess maybe there are, aren't any studies of, on comparing these people, or, or, or are there? Uh, there's not so many studies on that. I mean, there are studies that compare sort of trained freedivers and their breath hold times, and also, for example, lots of studies that show the, the spleen size uh, versus non-trained, um, non-freedivers. And, you know, obviously the training mechanism is greater um, in the in the free divers, actually, they get a, a greater um, uh, sort of like contraction of the the spleen, and it recovers really quickly as well. And it and, and what I mean by recovers, I mean it, it um, goes back to its full size much quicker. It's already starting to do this within an hour, you know. And it raises the question, you know, like can we use um, breath holding, like you know a series of breath holds before competing in an event in a way to get the really um high quality blood already flowing inside the body uh before competing you know as a as a sort of like a performance in enhancing thing and of course we know we know that that's already been happening in certain um sports you know it's always like a well known thing that uh, the tour de france and uh, lance armstrong when when they have in, you know when he got in a way, caught for um, having, you know, basically EPO in the body, which is the hormone that uh, basically signals to the body to produce, um, yeah, you know, basically to get the 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 oxygen, like the highly oxygen, uh, high level of oxygen blood. I hate this word oxygenated, oxygenated, or whatever you say. It's I always trip over that word, but yeah, getting a lot of uh, healthy blood moving around the body. Uh, he was saying that, like, you know, 18 of the top 20 uh, riders in the Tour de France uh, are injecting um, their own blood, which has has already got higher levels of EPO, um, you know, so it's blood doping. It's their own blood, but it's also, you know, they want that to to repair, recover, and get ready for the next stage so they can perform at a higher level. So mm. in, my, in, my, in my mind, in my view, uh, breath holding would be an abs absolutely a great thing to do before your competition. You know, any of these athletes at the Olympics, for example. Mm. Is that like the bore effect that this causes that door? Well, it's it's part of it. It's part of it. Um, it you know, it's like the bore effect. Uh, what you're referring to? That's the that's li literally sort of like the principle that um, you know, CO two is actually the trigger to release oxygen. So our bodies. Um, a lot of people get a little bit confused that uh, when they're breathing, they feel like, okay, I just took a breath in, now the oxygen's in there, you know, somehow. Well, in actual fact, we need uh, CO2 uh, to rise gently, um, don't need extreme uh, CO2 levels, uh, by the way, all the time. But even just a gentle pause after the inhale is enough time to allow the CO2 level to rise the chemoreceptors will kind of notice the rise in temperature slightly, also the rising levels of CO2, and then re uh, release actually the oxygen from the, the protein in the blood, the hemoglobin in the blood. So, you know, those breath holdings, the breath holding times uh, are very much, you know, like when, when you're holding your breath, the, the CO2 levels are like going off the charts, you know, and uh, that's actually when a lot of the blood is actually being released inside the body. Um, for, for anyone listening or watching this one, um, you know, the Wim Hof method, uh, if you've been practicing these breathing techniques, which involve kind of like rapid, almost like a hyperventilator, hyperventilation slash superventilation, 
over breathing practice followed by the pause in between that's having the same dynamic right so you're kind of in a way breathing like is like literally giving away the co2 which which in turn by the time you get to the sort of pauses or these breath hold moments it actually gives you longer time because you've been dumping off the co2 and that means that you'll have a longer time where the co2 needs to kind of gently build up eventually it'll start building up to a point where the body realizes this notices this and then starts dumping the oxygen inside of uh, from the hemoglobin in the blood and that's when you feel really really uh, the tingles and you feel really good you know and a lot of people don't know what it's like to be getting that much oxygen uh, going into the tissue because we're we're not breathing correctly um, in society because of all the stress and anxiety and all those sort of things mm, right yeah so, so how does the let's yeah a lot of people might have heard about Wim Hof the hyperventilation mm. so what's yeah like what what is the difference between if you're like hyperventilating and uh holding the breath like uh, how does it affect the body differently yeah so the difference between hyperventilating and holding the breath is when you're breathing in of course you like you have to think about the atmosphere right the atmosphere itself it's only about 21 percent of the atmosphere that we're walking around and breathing and all this is actually oxygen then when you breathe in only a, on average only about five percent of that oxygen makes its way or finds its way into the tissues into the cells so when you look at this principle of the Bohr effect and and in a way the breath holding in a sense and having these these periods of time in between the inhale and the exhale essentially um what that does is kind of we we know that we can influence that or sort of like manipulate that in a way or hack that biohack that in a sense where we just have the pause we let the co2 level rise and then we kind of like in a way um you know induce the oxygen being released into into the bloodstream so the real difference is that like hyperventilating um which is something a very very sympathetic way of breathing in a sense is very active usually when it's using the mouth it's dumping off a whole bunch of co2 um it's it's kind of like it's it's something that we can use in an acute burst like the wim hof method breathing or like free diving training apnea training so we can use it like as a as a tool in a sense but if we're walking around every day hyperventilating we can obviously see that that's not going to be good for us because we will get, be getting less and less oxygen uh, when we actually need it, you know. And of course, that that has that has a, a link to hypertension, anxiety, stress, and all those sort of things as well. Hmm. Right. And uh, if is it possible to use hyperventilation for some sort of performance enhancing effect, or when would you like use it? Yeah, mainly, mainly like what I mentioned. Mainly, it's very good at like dumping uh, the CO two away. I mean, that's the that's the most uh, healthiest way to to utilize like in a way like the hyperventilation. If you're kind of like like consciously using that or utilizing that in your breath work, um, you know, it's really interesting because like there's there's like a growing there's sort of like this growing um, awareness, let's say, about you know, sort of like this, what people call or refer to uh, uh, simulated altitude training, right? So what that essentially means is like recreating the situation inside of the blood where um, you have like these lower levels of oxygen, right? So uh, even this is like not a new thing in a sense, because like there was even this uh, famous Olympian, like people are probably watching the Olympics at this point as well as there's this uh, Emil Zadopek, and he was a Czech athlete. Um, and he, I think he was like, uh, I think at the Helsinki Games in 52, he won like three gold medals. And uh, he was known to be really like an innovator um, of running. Uh, like he had a lot of different unique training uh, methods. Um, but then also, you know, like he really had, he, he was the one, one of the first ones who would run and do breath holds whilst he was running. Because he kind of understood that you, when you have these higher levels of CO two, you're kind of getting that oxygen, like 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 dumping into your your bloodstream, right? Mm. And 
also, I mean, there's other things that he did too. Like he ate dandelions like before the race, like he had, you know, these dandelions. Uh, and also he uh, would eat like birch leaves because he felt like, okay, if a deer can run really fast, then I will eat birch leaves like a deer, you know? So he was like kind of a, a bit sort of like a mad scientist, but um, mm -hmm. lots of people are really referring to him uh, nowadays because of this high altitude um, you know, the simulated high altitude training. And mm. uh, we know that people, for example, have, um, you know, you know, ox oxygen saturation of sort of like 90, like 94% and under starts to be, starts to become more, um, you know, like a bre dysfunctional breathing pattern. So if you're ever measuring your own, you know, a lot of people have these different uh, tracking, um, like, you know, they're measuring a lot of their their things, like a lot of the good watches nowadays, uh, polar watches and so on, you can measure this. But if you start moving too far below 94% blood oxygen saturation, then you start to become like, you know, it becomes an issue for you. And he was training at like in, in 85 and under, you know, wow. blood oxygen saturation, which is like being at like 10,000 feet uh, or 10,000 meters altitude, you know. Mm. That's, that's a huge advantage for like a lot of these Olympic athletes that train in Morocco and Kenya and these these high altitude uh, locations because they train there, they come back down and they they the body adapts always. So they always have this advantage. And a lot of athletes in America are also training in Colorado and these kind of yeah. elevated. Yeah, like uh, I remember, you know, Estonian skiers a lot. They uh, used to also go like to the swiss alps to train for skiing and uh you know estonia isn't <laughs> very mountainous it's pretty flat and uh, yeah it does appear that you know all the pro pro athletes tend to use some form of like altitude training uh to get some sort of performance uh, enhancing boost so is it more like similar to uh heat adaptation so like y if you are training in a hot environment as well then your body is like uh, becoming more heat adapted and it can also just exercise for longer in a cooler environment because of that you're able you're able to regulate your body temperature uh, better so you postpone the over cool overheating of the body so is it like yeah, something, it. Si something similar that you're like improving the efficiency of your uh, i guess blood oxygen saturation in this kind of a hypoxic environment and then in a normal normoxic uh, like a normal oxygen environment you're you you just it like feels better or it's easier because of that yeah exactly and you know like basically that this whole concept of co2 tolerance uh that's where this comes in right so it's like um basically training the mechanism in the body where uh a person can uh withstand high levels of co2 in the body right like um we we know for a fact like the you know when you really look down like to the basics of breathing i mean like we breathe because we need oxygen because it goes through a chemical process like we we can't eat food and then our bodies just utilize that right as energy of course so it must go through the chemical process with oxygen in order to create the molecule you know the atp adenosine triphosphate of course which our bodies can use but the body has that backup system, and this is where we're talking about this lactic acid. So anybody who's been training um, in different, different, you know, whatever it is, like even if you're just doing uh, running, like training, your legs get really heavy um, because eventually if you're running and participating in exercise for an extended period of time, it becomes harder and harder to get the, the oxygen really where it needs to go inside the body. So, you know, we, that, that process is going to happen in basically anybody, but you can train it, right? You can, you can train the body to kind of withstand the higher levels of CO2 and kind of like uh, offset or delay the offset of the lactic acid buildup, which is kind of mm. the, which is a form of energy, but it's just a really, really laggy, slower way of energy, uh, form of energy that makes its way to become available eventually. And it's also very, very resource intensive to make uh, lactic acid in the body as well versus uh, oxygen and ATP. Mm, interesting. So what would be like a protocol for uh, training that 
So like if you're not going to go to altitude to train, like uh yeah, what would you what would be like a training protocol look like? Or would you like just be more do you have any specific like during the exercise itself you would use any specific breathing type? Or is there like a specific like okay, workout time, I'm gonna do this for five minutes, ten minutes, this this kind of exercise for breathing. So how would you like what's that <laughs> how do you do it? Yeah, I think actually, I think I remember that you have you have been kind of doing this like sort of like in a way like the entry level version of this. You've been doing kind of like by yourself uh, for a long time, if I remember, because we have had a conversation a, a long time ago about it. But like just doing these apnea walks, you know, mm. like most people feel like you know when you start talking about these things, and you know, the, you know, there's no way around it. I mean, if you start holding your breath for three, four, five minutes trying to trying to sort of like uh, induce these these you know <laughs> recruit all these systems to give you this this awesome oxygen like high oxygen blood and all the rest of it I mean it it feels like very uncomfortable right and so asking someone to go straight from a from like a novice or never have done this before to go into that setting it's very very difficult but there's an easy way that anyone can basically go in and try it and to experience that and that's literally just to kind of um do these apnea walks where you would literally just take one breath in and exhale to neutral you don't like you don't do it on empty lungs you just take a breath in you take your breath to neutral and then you would like walk 10 steps or maybe 20 steps or maybe 30 you don't you don't get to like 27 and then kind of walk faster you just do it in a regular walking uh, rate you would measure that you would breathe in and out, uh, recovery breathing using your nose. Um, and then when you feel that you're kind of rested and recovered, you can do it again. And the good news is you can basically do that anytime, anywhere. Um, I posted a video not too long ago where I did that up a bunch of stairs. I don't know, maybe 80 stairs, um, one breath in, exhale, and then all the way up. And that was no joke because, it, you know, like when you're, when you're going up the stairs, there's more muscles involved. Um, but this is an easy way to train. So that's kind of like the entry level. But then if you want to get those, uh, like I, like I kind of mentioned before, if somebody wants to get like into this, like really good state inside their body before they do their athletic training, or even just some cardio, cardiovascular training in the gym, on the treadmill, rowing, whatever, one really cool thing to do is literally just, um, like you warm up a little bit, but then you would go and practice your max breath holds uh you would do like five five rounds of that so obviously you would probably get a a better and better breath hold time but you would you would just literally take one deep breath in to about 85 90 percent you don't want to be completely 100 percent full because it feels very tight and very uncomfortable and you can have a bit of pressure in the throat and other areas chest and so on but you would just hold your breath for as long as you can time that if you want to or you don't have to you can just do it as best as you can then you would recover uh recovery breathing for about a minute or so after it can also be a bit longer if you prefer um then you would you would repeat this either three to five times and you should um you should probably uh, get this um reaction from the spleen on some level um you'll have really healthy blood in, in your system before you even train that's an easy protocol to do. Um, you don't have to like go crazy where you're like feel like you're bursting or your face is going really red or anything like that. It's it's one that you would practice laying down in the gym um, because obviously there's some some possibilities of like you know if you go really really deep into a breath hold you could feel a little bit dizzy because of the, you know because you're you're not breathing for a while. So you can do it safely whilst you're laying down. Um, it's a it's a great one. It's a really good one. Hmm. yeah it's like very similar to exercise or like cardio in general so you just need to do some of it in some form exactly. and just doing more will uh, inevitably increase the results so if you do more cardio or you're like your max improves and if you do more breath holds and you hold it for longer then yeah it's gonna improve as well yeah i mean like in in my book i kind of I call it like the um, it's it's funny concept, but it sounds like microdosing death in a sense, right? Because it's like it kind of feels like okay, everything in your body is saying okay, I'm not breathing, 
this feels a bit weird, this feels a bit scary, but in a way it's kind of like a very uh, calming, relaxing feeling as well. So it's a, you know, it's about, it's like anything, the the ego or the mind wants to sort of like understand all outcomes and have control of everything. And it's a really, really good practice of just like kind of a bit letting go and just trusting the body and really connecting with the diaphragm because the diaphragm starts moving around and everything. And um, just knowing that you have, you, you always have a little bit more than what you think you do inside. Mm, yeah. And um, what about then like everyday breathing? So uh, obviously breathing is <laughs> essential for life and uh, a lot of people might have a wrong understanding as well of you know what is actually the correct way to breathe or like a healthy way to breathe so maybe we can uh, talk about that yeah of course and you know like it's 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 not a mystery at this point uh, you know we're talking about nasal breathing uh, first and foremost um because of all of the you know the hygienic reasons of course we have the you know this this these evolved bodies of ours, they don't waste space, you know. So, like, when we have, like, a very, very complex network of, you know, passages and systems through here, like the the, the, the sinus and the paranasal sinus, uh, it's there for a reason, you know. And then we, we think about how much space we have in the cheeks, the soft palate, the throat, and then all the lungs. I mean, this is the respiratory system. And to be able to, like, breathe through the nose – um it's like the most natural way uh because we know that breathing through the nose recruits the diaphragm to pull down create a negative pressure allow the oxygen to come in uh we understand that the like i said earlier the intercostal muscles are quite a key part of this because as they can flex and as they can open up um allows a bit more flexion allows a little bit easier breath and maybe a fuller breath of air in as well so it, it's important to have like yoga practices or any of these kind of stretching where we have like really, really flexible um, intercostal muscles and remembering that they, they wrap right around the rib cage as well. So there's a lot of biomechanical things we can do, um, but they are aided by nasal breathing. Um, and we also know that it's a very, you know, it's an anti like nitric oxide is the biggest thing like that we know uh, more and more about recently. It's a, a special molecule that's created by only breathing through the nose. We cannot produce it when we're breathing through the mouth. And the way it's produced is kind of, I, I, I kind of say it's like uh, similar to like a turbo in a car in a sense, you know, because a turbo in a car uh, creates like, a, it spins around, the air actually spins around so quickly that it creates this kind of, um, this nit you know, like this like boost in a sense. And in a way we're getting the same thing when we're breathing through the nose. It enters the paranasal sinus so quickly that it's spinning around and it creates this nitric oxide molecule and that's actually really interesting because it's a vasodilator so which means that all of the the blood vessels in the nasal area and of course the the bronchi and the bronchioli which are the branchy things in the lungs they will open up and be able you know that makes it easier to breathe obviously but then it's also antifungal antipathogen antibacterial so if we keep them, if we keep the mouth shut and just breathing through the nose, it's biomechanically better for us. It's more efficient. It's easier. It gives us more energy than it takes to breathe. But then it also has these hygienic um, factors involved as well. And mm. just just to throw it in there as well, I mean, like if you if you if the average person goes to a medical profession and asks, uh, they 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 claim that they have some breathing issue. Um, 90 whatever percent of the medications that they're prescribed will have some sort of um, content in there that are aimed at uh, dilating the veins or having this vasodilation inside of mm -hmm. them. So a lot of asthma medicines and things of that are actually trying to perform the same task as we would otherwise do when we're breathing through the nose. And of course, there's I always carry these things around with me too. I have like eucalyptus oil, tea tree oil, things of this nature that open up the blood vessels and make it easy to breathe as well. But nasal breathing, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I think a lot of people have seen these pictures online of the mouse breather versus uh, nasal breather uh, children. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's, you know, one of the most uh, shocking examples of, uh, 
know, what is healthier and uh, what which one we should actually do all the time or most of the time. Yeah, it, it, I mean, there's really a lot of studies and, and a lot of those are coming to light now. The more that we're understanding breathing and, and the effects of that as a, you know, earlier ages, I mean, we're showing that the, I mean, you have an amazing, like very, very defined jawline for sure, nasal breather. Um, but this is affected at childhood, you know? So if, you know, the reason being is that if, uh, someone has their mouth, uh, like, let's just do it. Let's just do the, the quick practice. I mean, if you take three breaths using your mouth, two and three, the tongue, you, if you notice where the tongue is sitting, it's down, it's down in the bottom of the mouth, you know? Whereas if you take three breaths through the nose, two, and three, you notice that the tongue wants to sit up, up in the roof of the mouth, right? So that's where we have the, the harder and softer palate. Um, in those developmental years of a child, of course, the tongue sits up and the craniofacial structure starts to, and the airway especially, starts to grow around the tongue if that child's breathing through the nose if the tongue's down then it still it still grows but it grows lower and it's not so much more defined because the airway doesn't need doesn't have any prop there to keep it open and of course that has a knock on effect with the again the craniofacial structure and especially the cheeks and the jaw uh, if it's if it's smaller and it's more compressed in then again there's not room for the the teeth to grow and then they have like dental dental issues as well. But then also these um, studies that show like, uh, you know, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, higher IQ with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing and things of that nature. So it's quite a quite a important thing um, for any parents out there to kind of ensure that their, their child has every possibility to breathe through the nose, you know. And a lot of those things can be, um, just small mindfulness practices and repetition to kind of encourage them to sort of like close the mouth when they, you know, doing certain things and whatever. Um, yeah. But also, of course, there's a, there's the props, you know, I, I keep these things around, the nasal dilators are around there so people can kind of like, you know, they they work by just placing those inside and propping open the, the nostrils because a lot of people, they, they really struggle. I mean, we have a lot of tra trauma things that happen to us physically right so the the shape of the nostrils the shape of the nose can be kind of like a restricting factor uh, psychologically or actually physically and um, sometimes those little props the nasal dilators and what what whatsoever they actually help give people the ability or the confidence in some cases to just basically breathe through the nose once again mm. yeah and you made those nasal dilators right yeah found a way to make make them they're, they're kind of fun thing like they're actually getting pretty popular these days because they they're they're so easy they're just a little thing i can even show like real quickly like this you pop them up there if you they're, they're always the easiest way to show is like the nasal wall collapses and then when we put it in it has just a little prop where now it's like really mm. easy to breathe in so there's a lot of things coming now like um um, you know, there's these kind of magnetic things that go over, but they still require some small magnetic device in inside the nose. So it's kind of like it 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 opens up the airways, but they always require some sort of subscription because you need to buy like a month supply of the little things that help it do that, and the strips that go across subscription again you're supposed to wear you can only use one of those every day so in a way these are good because you can just use them all the time, wash them off as you need to. And in fact, um, in the Olympics, I have seen uh, athletes using those um, oh, really? because, of course, when you breathe through your nose, you retain a lot more moisture and uh, water inside the body, up to about 40% more uh, retention of uh, fluids in the body. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you, you can use them like when you're sleeping, you know, if you're using a mouth tape, then uh, combining that with uh, this, this uh, device as well is like you're yeah doing uh, both things at once in the good yeah, way exactly yeah yeah i mean these things are more like a training um like aid in a sense right like um because a lot of people 
uh, for example, there's there's people that still I, I love the I love these guys. They're good. They're good people. They're in the biohacking scene and what what not. But they're forever like saying, "Hey, I'm still taping them out." And it's like three, four years later, I'm like, "Hang on, you're still taping?" Like the <laughs> the idea of still wearing diapers. <laughs> still, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like trying to adapt to that, right? So, like you know the. The, the concept of taping the mouth is actually really just to kind of like promote the idea or the concept of the lips being closed so that you, you know, you have a better opportunity to breathe through the nose, right? Especially mm -hmm. when you're sleeping. Um, it's not about sealing the mouth closed. I always feel like I have to say that because um, people, they, they want the best for their children. They, they try and tape the kid's mouth shut and things like that as well, which is like, you know, that's not correct. But it's literally just about like a vertical tape like this where you can kind of like just uh, get the mouth closed like that. Mm. And then the beauty of nasal breathing is the more that you do it, the more it becomes possible and the more it becomes the default mode of breathing. So it's kind of like this very, very easily trainable, um, you know, process in the body. Um It goes the other way too. If we stop doing it, then we kind of go into that. We go down that path as well and we become mouth breathers so the idea of being able to be in bed for six seven eight hopefully eight nine hours in some cases for some people that long of time and just be able to be practicing nasal breathing it's like one of the only things i know that you can do where you don't have to actively be participating in it right so the taping becomes kind of like a good mechanism there but after some weeks you kind of like have to wean yourself off the tape. Um, otherwise, you might you might end up becoming like uh, reliant on those, you know. And there's we like these things are just there to to give more power and more recognition inside the body, so you can take control and take responsibility of those very very uh, fundamental things, you know. Breathing being one of those. Mm, right. What about exercise? So. Uh like what what would be like a good way to ex breathe when you're exercising yeah also nasal breathing right so um again that's why these that's why the nasal dilators are so so critical because a lot of people um once they become stressed or they be, they get into this active kind of stimulated um in a way sympathetic state uh, the mouth hangs open and then of course when we when the mouth hangs open we know that the upper body becomes more involved in the breathing the upper chest the big muscles here you know especially someone like you seem like you've been training a lot you know big muscles in the upper body they require blood and oxygen right so if you're breathing like this and you you all of these muscles here require the blood and oxygen and it kind of takes it away from like if you're a performance athlete running for example it's taking that away from the where it needs to go in the legs and these larger running muscles and whatever else whatever else you're using and it's kind of like going to those it's kind of called blood stealing in a sense so that's why we want to practice the nasal breathing because we know that when you breathe through the nose it's going to pull the diaphragm down let it do its work you know the breathing muscle that is the diaphragm you know as uh, i made a joke about this not so long ago well not joke but it's kind of like i touched on this a lot of guys especially we we are more than happy to go to the gym and like pump the bicep like you see some people do like like literally hundreds of rep on this i mean it's a kind of useful muscle in some ways but it's more an aesthetic thing right but where are the people that are training the diaphragm like where's the mastery of the diaphragm this breathing apparatus or this breathing muscle which is going to breathe for some people it's about twenty five thousand times a day where's the mastery of this knowing how much value it can give us and how much uh, extra energy it can it can give us it gives us this little boost so um yeah this is this is where we want to be nasal breathing whilst whilst running whilst performing um and as i said if you want to stack the things you do the breath holding before you do the do, do the performance uh whatever whatever event or whatever exercise you're going to do you can do some breath holds before you can use a dilator when you're running if you want to keep the airflow going um and then ultimately it's going to be much more biomechanically sound way of breathing but then also super efficient and basically it's going to help your performance because the blood and the oxygen is going to go exactly where it needs to hmm. right so so what is your 
book about so you um, i imagine you'd cover a lot of these topics in the book as well about uh, breathing yeah, I, I touch on a lot of these things. Like, it's a, there's a lot of storytelling in the book, but it's it's kind of like, uh, funnily enough, it's named Re-Spiritual Awakening. So in a way, it's a kind of a word play of sorts because like, um, you know, in Latin, spirare means spirit, which also means to breathe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when you translate that into English, for example, many different languages also um, have the same in Finnish, for example. Hengita is to breathe. And then henki is spirit. Mm. And when you look at the words, respire, uh, spire is actually like kind of like the circular uh, angle uh, motion in a way, like a spiral. The spine, in a way, the energy moves up the spine like this. A spire is like the top of a, you know, it's like the top of a, a point, for example, like a arrow tip will spiral as well. It always means energy. Spiral means energy. So re means again, re-energy, re-spirit, re-breathe. They all kind of like converge in this wordplay in a sense. So yeah, I talk a lot about these kind of um, different, um, like all kinds of different stories and uh, tales about breathing. Um, it's, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be up front. It's not like a science, science book because there's some great books out there that really cover those things. But I'm just kind of like weaving um, the things and all, all of these stories and sort of like the knowledge and the know-how into very, very practical things where people can really uh, take it on board themselves. But then ultimately, everything, like whether we breathe in a certain way, uh, for, for example, a lot of people want to guide people to this meditative state which is fine and it's great. We we need more of that. But then what happens then? You know, like in a way, sort of the essence or the fuel of life itself is kind of like finding the inspiration, which in Latin, it literally means to breathe in. Mm. So helping people really find the inspiration in their life. And I think that's what we're all kind of seeking uh, in many different ways. And I feel like I've found a way where we can actually breathe in a certain way where we can access the the inspiration almost any time. Mm. So that's like mm-hmm. a, some some special technique, or is it <laughs> very similar to what we talked about? No, it's like recreating. I mean, like if you if you think about in life where you've seen somebody uh, do something amazing, like the, again, the Olympics are, are arguably for some people a very uh, great source of this kind of inspiration right like you see people do amazing things you see people rise to the occasion and this is sort of a very very reflective thing when i see you uh, writing writing book after book i'm like looking at him and i'm like damn that guy's inspiring and i'm like how does he actually write all and you know how's he getting all this content so i'm kind of there looking at you for example and i'm getting inspired by you and then maybe you're seeing other people that look to you and say, hey, seems great. And you, there's this interaction where you're kind of re-experiencing your own inspiration through the people watching you. Mm. Yeah. So it's a very reversible thing. Like the Bama Hacking Sen- uh, Summit is a, a great example of that. When you see such amazing people on the stage and you see them living their inspiration. And so in a way, when you when you think back to any moment where you've actually been inspired, where you've actually been inspired, it really is this reactive, this exci- highly excitable, highly reactive moment where you're literally like, you're like really breathe in. And that's, in a way, it's called inspire, inspiration, because you're like breathing in like, like this. This is what it means in language. And so it's like really... Um, sequencing that same sort of form of breath in a certain way like like this and and sort of like meditating towards this inspiration and then of course like the idea is to get people to kind of uh, work with that journal and like trying to get the inspiration out of here out of the mind out out of here into into the action you know Mm. so it's kind of a there's a lot of philosophy in this book obviously as well um to kind of like uh, to accompany the storytelling. Nice. And uh, where can people get it and wh- when is it available? Yeah, on September 15th, it's available. It's going to be on Amazon. Of course, my website, um, 
you can find the links from my website, my leeyuan.com. Lee uh, and yeah, audio book will be available as well. Uh, that will include the exercises, so the inspiration and uh, the aspiration and all of everything in between. Um, those exercises will be there so that people can kind of like um, access access them whenever they need that inspiration or whenever they need to sort of aspire towards the top or breathe upon, as it means uh, in, in Latin. It means breathe to the top of something. Of course, expire is the last breath too. So hopefully we get to experience a lot of those inspirations, aspirations, and everything else in between before the last breath too. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's been uh, great talking with you. And uh, yeah, you know, it's your first book. Let's hope, let's hope there's many more uh, to come. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's been a process that's for sure it's kind of interesting thing because it feels like a snapshot of or some sort of in a way like uh who you are at that point of life in in this particular book you know and then mm. um yeah, yeah. it's interesting it's, it's been fun it helps me sure. it helps me learn much more much more as well yeah absolutely all right well i'll see you around thanks mate see ya all right, that's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.